Good evening. Welcome to Expert Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mandhian. Here at Expert Insights, we take external views of internal successes of foreigners, expats, and immigrants who have made Philippines their home. And sometimes we catch people who travel by the Philippines. Tonight, we are extremely fortunate to have caught a bird in our net, a gentleman by the name of Larry Farrell, chairman of the Farrell Company, lawyer, and an MBA graduate from Harvard, the guru of entrepreneurship in the 21st century. He has been teaching entrepreneurship for the last 30 years. And he has touched the lives of 5 million people across 40 countries. Has wrote book, mm. has, wrote, has written four books in line, nine languages. And today he is here to share his insights on the business of <coughs> entrepreneurship. Mm. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Expat Insights. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. So, uh, before we start talking yeah. about entrepreneurship, uh, give us a little background about yourself. Well, I, sh I think I should, uh, of course, also say that I'm, I'm here as the, my host here is Ateneo University, which I've been working with them for three years on this topic of entrepreneurship, and uh, pleased to be here again. Uh, in terms of my own uh, background and my interest in this, I think I was a more of a typical American manager uh, as, a young, as a young guy. Yeah. Uh, typical, I suppose, a, a Harvard MBA type, uh, fascinated by being a manager and working in big business. This is in the 60s or 70s? This 70s. is in the 70s. Right? Right, and uh, I am now what I think I can correctly say I'm a refugee from the big business world because I'm now more interested in entrepreneurs and small business uh, creating new businesses. Refugee or a divorcee? <laughs> well, I left on my own accord, but uh, I was becoming quite frustrated with uh, life. In, I worked for American Express and a few other companies. And uh, I thought uh, there's got to be a, a more interesting way. Now, this was early on, Roger. This was in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Before this revolution of entrepreneurship really took hold uh, that we see in the world today. So I was a bit early and I, and I always joke in the, when I first started my company here to, to research entrepreneurship and teach it, it was actually quite difficult to find clients. Uh, to do it because it to talk about entrepreneurship yeah or, because yeah. there there were no core even at Harvard Business School where I went to school we didn't have a single class on entrepreneurship can you believe it I mean but, but we, we didn't have a class but everybody else was an entrepreneur at that time well uh, 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 the entrepreneurial the boom, Rockefellers uh, no, Carnegie the, I, w I would say it, be it became really took hold in the mid 80s in the US. How about you know? Disney and how about the Sony? And well, how now you're getting right into the kinds of entrepreneurs. Cla classically or historically, the world has had, I think, just two kinds of entrepreneurs. One, what, what we call uh, the lifestyle entrepreneur, the family-owned business, small business. Yeah. It could be a restaurant, could be a dry cleaning shop, yeah. whatever. And there was no idea with those family uh, businesses that they were going to become a fortune 100 company they were just there as a way to earn a living all right now that that was the type of most people were the, that were entrepreneurs had that kind of a of a life then there was the classic the disney type the the, the classic entrepreneur that we read about uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, William yeah. Lever, these people, are, and they starting with the Industrial Revolution, really in the mid 1800s. You right. saw that post Renaissance. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so we went th that that two types of entrepreneurs. Very yeah. very few of the classic entrepreneurs. Lots of family-owned businesses around the world. Most of the great entrepreneurs that we read about today, though, from that era. The, uh, came from either Northern Europe or North America. They were right. very popular. The pioneers. The yeah. pioneers, you know, Henry Ford type people. Uh, Daimler and Benz in Germany, Lever in the UK, and so yeah. on. Okay. And that went up until uh, the Great Recession and World War II. At the end of World War II, uh, for <coughs> a lot of reasons, yeah. uh, particularly America became preeminent in business for the first time. Not pretty much dominating the world markets at the end of World Early War II. Into the 50s and late Into 40s. the 50s. And here's what happened. This is an interesting thing to me. Uh, everyone 
began wanting to be the organization man, the new manager, the working for IBM. The new the intellectual. City, the yeah. new, uh, was, it was the age of the manager. Correct. In 1945, starting then. And America began producing all these MBAs. You know. Right. And uh, entrepreneur almost became a dirty word during that time. That was the time I started my own career. Uh, I need to confess, yeah. uh, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and my dad was a small businessman. He yeah. was an entrepreneur. And uh, everybody else wanted to be a manager, to get yes, a right. job as exactly. a manager. This is the 60s and 70s. Exactly. And exactly. I did not follow my dad's footsteps. Good for you. Today, no, no, 40 years later, I regret it. Uh -huh. I regret it. I <laughs> wish I'd learned from him and probably taken it into the new century, yeah. the new age of entrepreneurship. Yeah. So that's my story. I align with you. Okay. So you have that history going yeah. up from 1945, the age of the manager, up until the late 70s, early 80s. Now, what happened for another set of reasons, good reasons, all right, yeah. uh, peop, young people began to become disaffected. And I think part of the reason is we had new heroes on the horizon. We had the Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs. Right, In right. Europe, we, we began to see people like Richard Branson emerging, and they became kind of folk heroes in, ter in business. And by the late 80s, 90s, and up through today, uh, young people began again to become more interested in starting their own business, working in a small company, and so on. So I kind of bridged that era. I started off as a manager. I, I wanted to be a manager. My grandmother, I was raised by my grandparents. My grandmother told me when you grow up, uh, become a, work, go to work for a big company, it's very secure, and so yeah. on. That leads us uh, up until the current time when really post 9-11 well post 9-11 but a new kind of entrepreneur has emerged which yeah. has become the uh, passion of my work actually and I call them economic entrepreneurs they're not classical in the sense of Andrew Carnegie and Walt Disney uh, they are people who are consciously choosing to start a small business versus going to work for the government or, or a big corporation. Isn't, isn't this, are, are they not similar to people who wanted to work from home? Are they the same crowd that you call economic entrepreneurs? Well, no, the work from home falls into the lifestyle. They're going to be small okay. businesses by and large and right. they, they want to do something out of the home and so on. No, these economic entrepreneurs uh, by and large have been fired from their corporate uh, job. Mm. <laughs> okay, laid right. off. All right. And they need to make a living. They have a family to feed. And they are sick and tired of being downsized by big corporations. And they say, yeah. this time around, I think I'll take my chances on my own and I'll start my own business. What kind of industries are they in? What kind of products are they the, putting out? Well, see, this is the, this is the happy circumstance yeah. of the entrepreneurial yeah. age that I write about in my yeah. books. Okay? It has never been easier in the history of the world to start a business than it is now. Yeah. And you have this, p this young people who are coming along <coughs> who are disaffected mm -hmm. with being a corporate manager. Right? Yeah. It's not that they hate business. They love business, but they don't want to be a manager at uh, IBM. Yeah. Right? And uh, so driving this has been new industries such as the high-tech industries, uh, computer software, and so on, where the capital to get started is not like starting a steel mill. Yeah. Or, yeah, or yeah. an automobile plant. Right. You can start a company for ten thousand dollars easy. It does mention you do mention that in your book. Yeah, yeah, in many of these industries today. So we have this happy confluence of, of events, right? right? To now, do anything, to, to choose anything. You can do anything and the market has become global. Yeah. No you know, your grandfather, your father, grandfather, mine, if they did start a business, yeah. they were pretty much limited to their little So why were they correct, correct? Yeah. So Larry, that's uh, the kind, yeah. Uh, we'll be taking a break. Okay. But before I take a break, I want to give you one minute. Just one minute. Huh? <laughs> and I don't want to miss this question for my life, you know. Uh -huh. uh, if you were just given this one minute to describe, define, or put across the meaning of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. how would you put it in one minute? We'll go into the depths of individual, corporate, and country entrepreneurship. You'll also understand what drives entrepreneurship. But take your time and give me a def... I don't want to call it a definition. Uh -huh. Last one minute on entrepreneurship. What would you say? Okay. 
I define entrepreneurship by the, by the practices great entrepreneurs follow, not some psychological definition. Right. And those practices are pretty well documented now in my research. Right. They have a strong, a powerful sense of mission about what they're doing, their work, sense right, of mission. Right, right. They are absolutely focused on two things, products and markets. Right, right. They, they right. live in that world. Yeah. They are highly innovative. We call it high-speed innovation is their third major characteristic. And finally, they are self-motivated people, self-inspired. So that we, we, I, I am sick and tired of these definitions of entrepreneurs. Oh, it comes from his grandfather, this and that, psychological. No, we define entrepreneurs by what they do. And those right. are the things they do. Right. So more action, more measurable, and more practice rather than the spiritual. And, and if I had to pick one, Raju, it is absolute focus on products and, and customers. All right, Larry, okay. we'll take that break and we'll come back and we'll ask you about individual, corporate and country entrepreneurship. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking to Larry Farrell of mm -hmm. the Athenaeo this time. Yes. To this Athenaeo and okay. we'll come back and talk to him in depth about entrepreneurship. Stay watching. This is Expert Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mantia. Welcome back to Expert Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mantia. And we are talking to La Larry Farrell and we are talking about his book and of course his expertise, the new entre entrepreneurial age. So Larry, can you go back and tell us about your definition or the meaning behind the entrepreneurship? Uh, mm -hmm. The four faces you mentioned, you mentioned sense of mission. Yes. Could you, mm. could you give us a little, uh, expand on that a bit? Yeah, it's the most difficult one, I think, to get the point across. And so we, uh, but sense of mission essentially means that uh, entrepreneurs work with a sense of purpose and mission about what they're doing. They, they love what they do, they're committed to it and so on. As opposed to going to work at a job to earn a living to feed your family. They, they have a job because they need to make a living. Entrepreneurs with sense of mission typically are driven by this mission of producing some invention that they've made or some service they've come up with. Yeah. And so it, it, it turns out though, Raju, that it, it is a tremendous competitive advantage to an entrepreneur to work with such a powerful commitment and sense of mission about their, their profession yeah. and, and their work as compared, you can imagine, as compared to a bureaucrat who goes to work nine to five, gets his check, goes home, that's it, and yeah. never wants to think about it during yeah. the weekend and so on. So, but in teaching sense of mission, we use great examples such as uh, Matushita in Japan and, um, and uh, the founders of IBM in the uh, States, Thomas Watson. These are, these are great entrepreneurial examples who are largely driven uh, by a, a purposeful vision of what they wanted to do. And uh, so we, we break it down in the seminars, of course, so it's more understandable, but that's ex essentially what Sense of Mission is. And, yeah. and it's, I've never met an entrepreneur anywhere in the world who didn't have it. So this is, this so is but important. So are the, uh, the question in that case would be, are people born with it or yeah. do people create oh, it? Is it, oh, this where is does a, it come from? How do I? This is a very old question, all right? Yeah. And, and uh, I, I have spent the last 30 years of my life uh, trying to convince people that entrepreneurs are, uh, can be made. And now, I, I think maybe 5% of entrepreneurs are born with it. There may right. be genetic entrepreneurs. Okay? So 95% of them can go to school. 95% yeah. of entrepreneurs, I believe, do it by choice. Uh, and this, it's never been more true than today with the, what I call the economic entrepreneur. Most of the new entrepreneurs in America, as an example, 55% of new entrepreneurs in America were fired from their last job and that's why they become entrepreneurs. Okay, they can't so Larry, did they become circumstantial uh, entrepreneurs or did they have this inner drive or something? No, or? circumstantial. They got fired. Right, right, okay? right. They got downsized from their fourth or fifth company yeah, yeah. and they got fed up. All right? Yeah. And so they decide to fend for themselves for a change. Correct, correct. But they have skills. They've correct, been to work yeah. at a big yeah. company and they've been to college and so on. They have skills, mm. but they convert those into small business uh, entrepreneurial themselves. So uh, the, the, just to finish on sense of mission, uh, any mission, whether it's military, political, business, you need to know what it is and how you're going to do it. So we, we focus on those practical aspects of sense of mission. The greatest entrepreneurs of the world have been very clear on what is their mission. They get everybody committed to the same picture. Yeah. And then they're exceptionally good operators. They're it's almost like leadership. Yeah, it is, it's a bit like leadership with a 
strong sense of purpose to it. So, yeah. since a mission is the very first. No, so the qu the question was: uh, five percent are born with it, ninety-five percent develop it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, fifty-five percent you say well, uh, circumstantial, but. How do you well, go about I, teaching or creating this? Well, you, you, you teach entrepreneurship the yeah. same way you teach anything else by the practices that great entrepreneurs have exhibited in the past. Mm -hmm. we, we've distilled those out in the books and the seminars and we teach those practice, those same practices. Right. Nothing in my books, nothing in my seminars, nothing I'm doing over at Ateneo University in terms of teaching right. is made up by Larry Farrell. It is all derived from research of observing the Walt Disney's and Steve Jobs and Richard right, Branson's right, right. of the world. Yeah. So it is very teachable, it is mm -hmm. eminently teachable. But your question is a good one. Are they born with it or made? You know, the, the, the living proof of that to me was <laughs> this uh, man I met, a German fellow I met some 20 years ago when Germany first became free and, and, and the communism was po post stopped. the Berlin Wall yeah post the Berlin. when the Berlin Wall fell in 92 right sir I, I was in the San Francisco airport and met a German businessman who had mm. ha has a shipping business out of Hamburg Germany but yeah. he originally and his family was from Eastern Germany mm -hmm. so he said like all good Germans what I was his name, Larry? Uh, it's in the book. I can't remember his name. Biol somebody? Biol Miol? Is that the German? No, I, that's the landscaper. Right. <laughs> this sorry, is another, sorry, yeah. this wild, is another yeah. gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. But he raced back to Eastern Germany in this new exciting time, right. post, post the Berlin Wall, yeah. to start a business there. All right. right? Mm -hmm. He said, you wouldn't believe it. After 52 years of communism, mm -hmm. the, the Germans on the west side, western Germany, hardworking, articulate, uh, com uh, driving, f uh, good business people, very tough competitors. I went over there and opened the same business, shipping business. I couldn't get anybody to work. No one wanted to come, and if the ship wasn't there ready to be unloaded, they all went home at 8.15 in the morning. He said they were lazy and, and, uh, and, and uh, had zero interest in, in, in work. And he said, I realized right then the power of communism, the power of, uh, of the environment. The ambience, yeah. Okay? The ambience. Yeah. And I realized what, what I take from that is, you know, here you had East Germans who were as lazy as the day is long, wouldn't do a good day's work, their life depended on it. The West <laughs> Germans, very competitive, very right. tough, hardworking people, yeah. yet they had the same grandfather. Oh, so it they, was the so environment it's rather than genetics. This, is, this isn't something you're born with. This right, is something right. that shapes you in, in, in the environment. Mm -hmm. I do give an allowance to the 5%. There may very right, well be right, 5% right. serial entrepreneurs right, in the right. world. But by and large, entrepreneurs are driven by their circumstance, and it's never been more true than today in today's world where so many... So thus the sense of mission can be created. It can... It can be a nurturing yeah, it, thing. It, it, it can, can be made into a very practical thing. Right, right, right. right fantastic. But, but at the heart of it, it, it is this, com this passion you know, yeah. that, that you actually... And think about this, Raju. It, it, the reason why it's such a, a competitive advantage is anybody who's doing something they love to do and feels passionate about, they're going to be a tough competitor. See? Absolutely, absolutely. Against the bureaucrat over here who's bored to death mm -hmm. with his job or her job. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the first principle. So the, the passion comes natural, but the spirit of mission can be created. Can be created. Oh, and, all right. And, and you have to be very clear on what the mission is and how to achieve it. Now, uh, uh, Larry. Yes. I call you Larry. So yeah, now let's go into the next two phases of entrepreneurship okay. that you're talking about. The first one, the second one is customer product vision. That's right. That's post, post the environment, post yeah. the sense of mission that I want to do something and my ambience creates it. Let's talk about product or customer okay. vision. Uh, this is the most important of the four characteristics that we teach, the four yeah. practices we teach, okay? Yeah. This is something that every entrepreneur has absolute focus on a product or a service mm -hmm. and on the custom, potential customers who will buy right. that. So it, it's tremendous focus on product, customer, and in our courses we call it uh, customer product vision. To have that That's clear new vision. Term, yeah. The thing about, here, here's a, again the competitive advantage of the entrepreneur. Most great entrepreneurs are good at both. They're good at product and they're good at market. They understand what the customer wants and they're very You never know which one uh, comes first. That, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and take uh, Disney, for example. All right? yeah. Was Disney a product genius or just a good customer a marketing genius? He was both. Steve Jobs, the, the world's greatest entrepreneur today probably is Steve Jobs. You know? yeah. Was he just a computer geek? Or, or did he, he want to fill a need? Or was he Mr. User-Friendly with making the small computer right, so, right, yeah. so everyone could have one? See, 
Carl, and sometimes it comes as partnerships, okay? Mm. Daimler-Benz, Carl, uh, Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler, the, the founders of Mercedes-Benz, of course, okay? Benz was the great product man. He was the engineer. He mm -hmm. invented the two-stroke engine. Mm. Gottlieb was the world's greatest salesman of the 19th century and early 20th century. They came together and made a beautiful company. So if you don't have both of those, like Disney and Jobs had, you can find a partner. If you're, if you're a technology person and, yeah. you, and you can invent some great new gizmo, some but new technical product. But you don't, product, can't take it to market. You, yeah, but you can't take it to market. Get yourself a partner who's a marketing enthusiast mm -hmm. and, and team up. So customer, so you can imagine though, this is so different from what happens in the big corporation. Mm -hmm. when, uh, for example, when I went to Harvard Business School, we were immediately asked upon registration, do you want to be in, man in, in production or marketing or finance? Yeah. You have to pick an area of business. Immediately, you're segregated off into one silo of the, of the business. Right? Yeah. So you focus on that and you spend your life in, a, in production as a factory. The entrepreneur never thinks like that. The entrepreneur constantly thinks, what can I make and who will buy it? It's a single integrated vision. So, so Larry, uh, how do you take this to the corporate level? How do you take this to a larger group of people? It's fine that a single person or a couple of guys partner together, but when you create something, a large corporation from the ground up, yeah. how do you instill the spirit of entrepreneurship in a team of, say, 2,000 or 4,000? You do what Disney did. Yeah. You, you, teach, you teach every employee that comes into the company the two most important things in this business, and these are the words of Walt Disney, all right? Yeah. Love of product, love of customer. And, yeah. you, and, and he fir went further. He created a situation for all employees where they were clear at an individual level who their product, what their product was as an employee and who they were serving. And mm. he quickly realized that most employees serve another employee. Mm. They have what we call internal customers. But this idea of customer product cannot be lost. The entrepreneur needs to push this idea down through his organization and keep it alive. What, what is, I think, is so telling you go into some large corporations, and some of the employees don't even know what the company's products are. Yeah. You know, they work in the data processing department, and they don't even know what the company makes sometimes. Yeah. And they're certainly not interested in it or expert at it. So this is a challenge, though. As a company does like Apple Computer, when it becomes bigger and bigger, how do you keep this notion of the importance of product and customer alive in everyone and that's the entrepreneur's challenge and job. So do. How, how do you bl blend or balance that with the individual, the employees or the people down in the front? Yeah. How do you balance or blend that with uh, their personal needs, their personal desires, their personal dreams? How do you sustain that balance? Well, and uh, if, if we were to drive everyone into entrepreneurship, that means we wouldn't have any large corporations. We no, wouldn't corporate have assembly lines. To be a corporate entrepreneur, as it's called today, to yeah. be an employee of a big company but be entrepreneurial in your approach to work doesn't mean you're going to leave the company and become an entrepreneur. Right. What it does mean, though, is that you understand the real nature of the business is to produce products that customers will pay for. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the essential rationale of the business. And every employee has to know his part in that. This is what I love about someone like Steve Jobs, for example, or Richard Branson. They don't let any employee ever think mm. the important thing here is accounting. The important thing here is, is, a, is the lawyers. Yeah. No, the important thing we're doing in the world is making products and services the world will pay for. Mm. So they keep this important notion alive. Distinction, yeah. Yeah, this distinction. And, and uh, the, if a company gets large where you have 5,000 employees making products in a plant, yeah. 5,000 marketing uh, sales force out here. Right. Many companies today, entrepreneurial companies, they're transferring people back and forth. They want their factory workers their to be alive and dynamic. To meet a customer. Mm. They make them a salesman for Google two or three does years. That. Yeah. Google does that. Or they take a uh, salesman and, and stick him in the factory for three years and, and really get him on Great the synergy. line making yeah. products. You know? yeah. Now, the guy that brought this to art to perfection was Michael Dell, Dell Computer. Yeah. Has it changed his format or style of business today? No. Or well, has well it it's changed in the sense that they have expanded the new markets, but when Dell started, they sold every computer over the telephone. Yeah, there, were, there were also little businesses all across the world, so like little mushrooms. Yeah. The guy or gal <laughs> on the telephone trying to sell a computer at Dell, yeah. all right, they had to know the computer. They had to understand it, and they also right. had to sell it. 
See, this, wow. is, this is the original make and sell business of Dell Computer. And so this idea, now when I started in, in working in my own career, you, mm. as I said, you went off into a function. You were either an accountant you, you were or in a, a salesman yeah. or you worked in the factory making the product. Yep. That is anti-entrepreneurial mm. and the great entrepreneurial companies mm. Try to blur that distinction. So uh, Larry, come, let's come to the fourth phase of entrepreneurship. We, well, you know, we we've, we've done innovation. Well, uh, we thought that was innovation in action. No, let's I, go I, no, innovation. No, yeah. High-speed innovation. Number. Three. Why high speed? I mean, isn't innovation naturally supposed to be fast? <laughs> Is there yeah. something like yeah. slow speed innovation? There's no such thing. Innovation without action is scientific research in a, in an ivory tower. Okay? That, yeah, that's that's, yeah, that's yeah. research. Yeah, that's yeah. research. So that's why I have to attach this phrase oh, high one. speed or, or innovative action because wow. innovation by itself, pure innovation and research, yeah. does not produce winning products in the in the business world. So. Innovation is probably the secondary word there. M moving quickly, being action-oriented is the most important thing. But innovation is, is the, what I call it is the secret weapon of the entrepreneur. Because you can be fast-moving and innovative, creative, all right, and fast-moving, <coughs> and that's the way you're going to beat your big competitors. Right? So it's more of speed rather than innovation because it, you said uh, well, the second phase is product vision, or yeah, customer uh, vision. That would drive innovation yes. itself, yeah. Yeah, well, that would, but uh, you can be innovative about billing practices, human resource practices. Oh, okay, product. You want to be creative about everything in the business and innovative, you know. Mm -hmm. So high-speed innovation turns out, in our opinion, mm -hmm. uh, in our research, to be the third important practice of great entrepreneurs. Uh, All right. And then we go to number four in the last one. Let's also go to number four this okay. moment because we have a break coming up. Okay. So the last phase you mentioned about entrepreneurship is self-inspired behavior. Exactly. Uh, isn't behavior self-inspired? Other than that, it's, it's driving cattle. Yeah. Self-inspired behavior is the underpinning of all the top three uh, characteristics I just described. Yeah, okay. yeah. Without that, you have nothing really. Now well, it's, it's tied into the sense of here, here's behavior. what I've yeah. learned. Here's what I've learned <laughs> about yeah. self-inspiration. All right. Yeah. And and why entrepreneurs are so self-motivated. It is not again because they're genetically different. It's because entrepreneurs learn from day one. If they don't make a product that a customer will pay money for, they can't feed their children. Right. Okay. Mm. Th this comes down to this old-fashioned notion of consequences for work. Yeah. Right? The entrepreneur feels the consequences of his or her work every Friday when they mm. open the cash drawer. Is yeah. there any money in there or not? Did we mm -hmm. feed? Did, are we going to feed the kids? This never happens to a big bureaucrat in a big company. Never. Mm -hmm. Never happens. Okay. I have personal experience. I write about it in the book. At American Express Company, it didn't matter if I did well, did average, or did poor, I got paid the same. Yeah. The entrepreneurs are, the reason they're so self-inspired mm -hmm. is because they realize if they don't have positive results in the business, they can't carry on, they can't feed mm -hmm. their kids, they can't pay their rent, and so on. So here again, you have this tremendous advantage entrepreneurs have over bureaucrats, over corporate managers. You know? mm -hmm. Now. I have a high regard for corporations because they're, they're our clients. We mm. teach them. So I love them. Right? But I'm just trying to draw out these tremendous distinctions. And if you can teach these four practices that I have described yeah. to managers inside Coca-Cola or IBM today, they're ahead of the game. They understand what it is that drives entrepreneurs and they can get that applied to their own corporate position. Larry, let's wrap the session up now. So sure. You're saying these four practices, four phases, are much more externally driven. There's a certain amount of internal drive, but mostly it's external demand yes, yeah. and meeting the customer right. needs. Yeah, no? Okay, we'll come back and talk to you about how countries can use this philosophy. Okay, Not just corporations and individuals, but countries like Philippines and other countries. Okay, fine. Right. So we are with Larry Farrell. We are talking about the new age of entrepreneurship. We'll come back. I'm your host, Raju Mandian. Stay watching Expat Insights. Welcome back to Expat Insights. I'm your host, Raju Mandi, and we are talking to Larry Farrell, and we are talking about the new age of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The new entrepreneurial age. Yeah. So, Larry, we've done four phases. The sense of mission and uh, 
product vision, yeah. customer product vision, innovation at high speed and self-inspired behavior. So you exactly. gave us insights and we have 15 minutes to go. I want you to talk to me about how these four phases or these four practices apply at the individual level, level. at the corporate, corporate level, level, without the corporates getting worried about everyone becoming an entrepreneur, right. and at the country level, how does a country employ the entrepreneurial mindset? Let's start with the individual. Right, sir. Uh, we've, I've happily discovered that there are these three major applications, and in our case, three markets. They represent three markets for our services, for our training and education. That's the individual. The individual, uh, the corporation, and the, and the, and the country, the, the yeah. government. Yeah. At the individual level, we do most of our work through universities. Uh, but this is the classical, let's uh, get a young person or, uh, to start a business. So w I found we don't go out on the street and teach, but we do work through leading universities. And that, that's why I'm here, in, of course, in Manila. It turns out that um, Ateneo, the Graduate School of Business there, has uh, taken up a passionate interest in entrepreneurship. And that's good. Why, why is that so? Because I, 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 think they, I think the dean, the dean of the uh, Graduate Business School there recognizes that this is a big need in the economy. Perhaps the country needs it. That's yeah, right. Come back to it, yeah. So let's not just produce good managers for the San Miguel's of the, of the world. Let's also produce... Besides that. Yeah, besides, yeah. besides that, let's yeah. also produce entrepreneurs. And uh, around the world, we work with a lot of universities and schools, and, and, uh, uh, and, and our materials are used there. At the corporate level, uh, since, uh, I'd say, since the... Uh, the economy has become so global and so tough. Mm. Many corporations, I think smartly, want to do what is called corporate entrepreneurship. They want to maintain their growth and they know that keeping an entrepreneurial spirit alive inside the existing corporation is a way to do that. So they want driven people, yeah. they want people who are engaged. And I, must, I must say, Raju, that's 70% of our worldwide revenue. We work in 23 countries, yeah. and in each country we have a representative. And, and in the Philippines, it happens to be Ateneo Graduate yeah. School. Am, am I glad? Am I glad? Yeah. <laughs> It's cool to be in. Yeah, it, it is. It's uh, wonderful people there. Yeah. Uh, the, third, the third application you mentioned, which we can spend a few minutes on, is, and particularly as it relates to a market like Philippines, is, is what we call national, creating a more uh, entrepreneurial economy for the entire country. Mm. Now, governments around the world have learned over the past 25 years yeah. that it's a good investment with tax money to try to foster an entrepreneurial economy, small business rather and so than on, rather than trying to get Toyota to build another plant here, which mm -hmm. can be very temporary, right? Yeah. Why not? Why can't the next Bill Gates come from Manila? Why not? This, uh, and this is what governments say. And it turns out that it's, it's not, to, not so expensive to do, you know, uh, to, to try to help young people, or it could be middle-aged people even, try to start their own business. Now, when we, most of the government clients we have are the economic development agencies of a, of a city or a national country. And, and it, uh, the, what the entrepreneurs are best at, besides making product, is... Besides making money. Yeah, is creating jobs. Mm. And this is... The, wait, this I, is I, I, okay. Larry, I, I need this cleared up, you know. Yeah, I mean, sure. Here you're talking about people going and getting their own thing done and, you know, being the master of their own domain and yet creating jobs. But then there are large corporations creating jobs. So where do we draw a line? How many jobs should I create as an entrepreneur? Yeah. And uh, how many people should I send through the management school and well, make, put them into the workforce? Where do well, I draw the, the line? The, the, the fact is large corporations are not creating jobs. Uh, uh, 80 to 90 percent of all new jobs are coming from small businesses. So we're talking about small and medium industries all across yeah, the world. All yeah? across the world. Yeah. You know, the IBMs, are the, I mean, I, right. I, they're, they're, they're shedding hundreds of thousands of jobs because mm. they're becoming more efficient. Yeah. You know, they'll get down to having two employees if they could. So the, the future of job creation, which is, which is the, the baseline statistic of all economies, mm -hmm. How many jobs are you creating Correct. versus how many babies you're delivering? Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. That is the job of the entrepreneur, and right. this is why That's the job of the government. Well, it's gov it's government's job to push that idea further. Right. To, right. to perhaps provide resources and and make uh, the country more entrepreneurial and friendly yeah. to entrepreneurs. Larry. Uh, yeah. Principles of entrepreneurship. You know the skills, the competencies of every entrepreneur. Uh, discipline, hard work, passion, uh, uh, 
uh, bootstrapping, you know. How mm. does a country instill that behavior to down to the country? How would you uh, well, there, there, factor there, that in? There are three. There are three things in the in the environment that governments can be really helpful about. Yeah. And the one they can create a more entrepreneurial uh, culture across the country. Yeah. Right? That what that simply means is from the from the financial community to the business community to the yeah. legal community to the education system they can create a, a national commitment to helping people start their, their own businesses. All right, all right, and, okay. And the other thing that's hard to... It's hard to... So also change the format of education, well, actually. Well, yeah. I'm, not talking, I'm talking about changing the, cult, yeah, the format of education, but also the culture. What mm -hmm. you need, instead of having the heroes of young people being uh, athletes and, and movie stars and rock stars, you want them to be Richard Branson and Steve Jobs. You want young entrepreneurs to suddenly become folk heroes like they are in the U.S. now. Mm -hmm. And very important to, to fashion that. The second thing that's needed, and you touched on it, is a bit of, ed is a bit of knowledge. Change in the format, the, yeah. The, the knowledge, okay? Yeah. First is to create an entrepreneurial friendly culture. Secondly, is to change the kind of knowledge you're teaching. Yeah. What we need to teach, and I don't want to be too old-fashioned on this point, but we have, uh, in my opinion, we need to teach young people how to make things the world will buy. Mm. Right? That yeah. means that the school systems of the or Philippines use, yeah. or any country, yeah. they have to become more practical in what they teach. Create more m tangible outputs. More yeah. tangible outputs, more technical schools, more technology uh, uh, symposiums, mm. more uh, vocational education uh, types, okay? mm -hmm. as opposed to pure academics. Mm -hmm. right? So because the, entre the, the, the entrepreneur needs to learn how to make a product. Right? Be a bit of a craftsman. And this is, where the, the, this is where the national education community has to come in and play a big part. Right? Okay. Larry, uh, let, me, let me bring this down to home. Let me bring okay. this down to my beautiful 7,107 islands. No? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see or what do you suggest, given that you've been around, given that you have this big picture philosophy? Let's call it a philosophy because you're not in favor of philosophy. What do you suggest <laughs> uh, Philippines do uh, to drive up its economy? Mm -hmm. What do you suggest we do? Uh, promote a lot more entrepreneurship, but in what? How do we go about it? What are your three suggestions? Well, I, I think that some of these things the Philippines is obviously doing already. Every country has taken note of the job creating power of the of entrepreneurs. Right? Yeah. But I think what you need to do here is work on these three uh, areas that I was mentioning to create a really, truly entrepreneur-friendly culture in this country. The same you know, thing that, that you mentioned. That, that yes. uh, yeah. to alter the education system so that okay. every child comes out of education with the ability to make or repair something that they, can, they could make a business of, become yeah. self-employed. Right? And thirdly is we call it a bit of money. The, 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 and this is the job that the financial community driven by the government could do here. Yeah. Make funds available for small micro loans to start businesses. Mm. Right. This, this so open the, up the financial the, market. The, that's here. right. This is essential. Mm. Now the good news on that is the average yeah. cost of starting a business is, is less than $10,000. You right. mentioned so, that. You yeah, mentioned so, that yeah. so we're not talking about hundred million dollar projects here for the government. All right. All right. right? So. And here's the beauty of it. If the for every young entrepreneur the government can inspire here or the community can inspire in, in the Philippines, that entrepreneur, successful one, will create five to ten jobs. Maybe more, 25 and, jobs. Yeah, and this is the creator of jobs that this economy needs. You have too many people here underemployed and, and looking for work, all right? And this, this is where I think the government can step so in. So basically three steps. Number one is that create the ambience for uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, small medium businesses, change or fine tune the educational the system educational a bit system. and open up the financial That's system. Exact, those three. O on that note, the last question today, last question, money. No? Uh, you yesterday or in your book, you cite the case of the success of Taiwan mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And you mentioned the finance minister, the minister of economics, Mr. Katie Lee. Katie Lee. And one of his ideas was never print money you do not have. <laughs> it was a beautiful yeah. one. I was just yeah. thinking about it. I mean, macroeconomics and um, microeconomics come home together over yeah. there. So when you say never print money you do not have, 
that applies to a country's GDP, gross national product. So uh, how do you align that or match that with the individual who needs to borrow money to put up a business or a country needs to borrow money to mm -hmm. change its uh, economy? How do you relate that? How can Philippines learn from that? Well, Never print money you do not have. What, uh, Never borrow money you do not have. Yeah, well, of course, Kay, as you know, Roger, K.T. Lee is one of my heroes in, yeah, in my yeah, books. Yeah, in the book. Okay. Fabulous hero. Yeah. And, he, and he said a lot of things, one of, which, one of which was inflation robs everybody of their yeah. wealth. Yeah. And the printing money that you can't back up with gold yeah. or whatever is in, causes inflation. Right. His, his point there was that at the government level, you need to keep your financial fiscal house in order also. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be creating funds to loan money to entrepreneurs. Right. He was just saying, stop the printing presses of the money. Mm. All right. And his point was that inflation is the great depriver mm. of prosperity. All right. It just eats away at your wealth. And uh, Taiwan, of course, for the last 50 years has had average inflation of 2.2%, lowest the in the world. Amazing, right? So it's therefore, therefore, print as much as you produce in terms right. of goods and services, rather than in terms of paper and coins. That's right. It says that at the government level, we keep our economic house in order, which which they have done. But he said other things. His fifth principle, uh, is he had very important recipe for entrepreneurship, was. A country's job is to help make its people prosperous. That's its number one job. Af that. After That's national security. Prosperous, okay. not just keep happy. Its, yeah, keep its people prosperous. Help them become prosperous. And, and, and finally, uh, honor uh, and develop entrepreneurs. He said the entrepreneurs have made Taiwan what it is today. And uh, I'd like to see the Philippines take that kind of approach, not, not copying exactly, but that, that idea where the entrepreneurs are the heroes of our economy here. Larry, thank, thank you, you so much for this interview, but before you go, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about your partners in the Philippines. The Ateneo Graduate School of Business in Makati will flash their website details, okay. no? yeah. and I'd like to give, uh, number one, I'd like to talk about their program, Master yeah. in Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. This used to belong to AIM, and now it belongs to Ateneo, so yeah. it's equally good. And if you want to sign up, this is who you contact. Mm -hmm. So you have a few words for Ateneo to this camera. Yeah, uh, just one minute. Then, well, I've uh, been working with the uh, Graduate School of Business there for three years now, and the reason that I think they selected me and why I'm so happy to be with them is that they have become the hub of entrepreneur development in the entire country of the Philippines. This is their passion there. They continue to produce good MBAs for Philippine companies, no doubt about yeah. it. <laughs> but, Blue but, yeah. but they also have a strong commitment to developing uh, entrepreneurs coming out of the school. And this is what I see at the leading universities around the world are doing this, from Caltech in Pasadena, California to Cambridge. Ateneo is the best example I've seen in Southeast Asia of a university dedicated to producing, helping to produce entrepreneurs for the economy here. So it's nice to meet you. Muchas gracias, senor. Mabuhay to the Philippines. <laughs> and uh, you catch this show tomorrow, to, on Monday too, Monday 4 p.m. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for watching Explat Insights. I'm your host, Raja Mandian. We'll catch you next Sunday. We'll have a guest from the BPO industry and a lady from the training industry. So good night and mabuhay. Thank you so much, Larry. Mabuhay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.